right? Same thing with this guy. So, if you listen to this guy, you are gonna find out. We have with us, if you can get past all the issues, we have one of the greatest Bible teachers in the world. We have the greatest apologist against Islam, not in the world, in history. And if you know me, you know I do not toss around comments like that, right? I'm dead serious here. You go to all of history, this is the guy. All right, so with that said, he's going to be talking about not Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses. But he's just as epic at that. All right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's my habit to always begin by invoking the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we love you, and we love your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we love your Holy Spirit. I ask for the sake of your Son that you bless this session. Anoint me by the power of your Holy Spirit to speak truth clearly for the glory of Jesus and bless your people here who are present, Father. Without your Holy Spirit, I'm not <clears throat> up for the task, so I depend on your Spirit, Father. So Abba, have mercy on us. And use me to strengthen your church. Use me by your Spirit to cause your church to fall more passionately in love with your very heart, Jesus Christ who became flesh. Because Christ is your heart, your love that became flesh. And we thank you for the gift of your heart. We thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for the Spirit. We need you, Abba. <clears throat> I need you. We need your Son. We need your Spirit. Have your way. Be magnified. And I say on behalf of the church, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. And Holy Spirit, we love you. In Jesus' name. Now, before I begin, again, as you can see, I don't know if I should cry or rejoice after that introduction, but one thing I do want to say, and it's not, I'm not complimenting him because he complimented me. He's actually proof of predestination. I had no choice working with this man. It was predestined before the foundation of the world, so I'm stuck with it, but no. I thank the Lord for David Wood and vocab. It is an honor truly an honor that I'm part of this apologetics team because in my estimation, these two brothers are the best and I love them from my heart. And I mean this when I say this, I'm willing to die for them for the sake of Jesus. So I thank God for them and I wanna thank the pastor for allowing me to come because he doesn't really know me, but he trusts vocab's decision to allow me behind the pulpit to be used of the spirit to bless his people. God bless you, pastor. Bless the members of your church and watch over you and shine his face upon you. And I love you for the sake of the Lord. With that said, I just want to take, I know because they said 55 minutes, but you don't understand. When you say 55 minutes to the Middle Easterner, that's three hours. You need to repent of your Western ways. <laughs> Jesus was Middle Eastern. He worked on Middle Eastern time. So when it says 55 minutes, we'll be out of here no later than midnight. <laughs> and you're going to love it, right? <laughs> With that said, I want to see where, what happened to this guy, James. Did he disappear? Oh, there he's going. I just want to take a moment to introduce some people that are dear and near to my heart. James Yonan, I want you to stand up. <clears throat> He's probably one of the ugliest Assyrians you'll ever meet. But besides that, this man, me and him go back pre-Christian days. Him and his three brothers were actually the first Assyrians, Assyrians to become professional boxers. And now he's a fighter for Jesus, an evangelist. And he is someone dear and precious to my heart. So James Yonan, God bless him. Sitting over here, we got four special guests that came to hear me tonight. They too are my family, my relatives. You have two Sargons here, Sargon Zomaya and Sargon Koma, and their better halves, their spouses. They are here because they believe that the Lord is going to show up in a mighty way, and they happen to be Assyrian. For those of you who don't know who the Assyrians are, if you want to make sure you're going to enter heaven, you need to learn the language of the Assyrians. You know, Muslims tell you Arabic is the heavenly language. That's a lie. It's Assyrian. Now, the reason why I say that, all joking aside, Assyrian are actually people found in your Old Testament. There are two books in your Hebrew Bible that describe <clears throat> my ancestors. Can anyone guess which two books in the Old Testament speak of my ancestors, the Assyrians? Not Syria 
We're not from Syria. We're not Arabs. We're much older than the Arabs. But you'll find the Hebrew Bible speaking of my ancestors quite often. And there are two books in particular, two books that deal with my ancestors. Can anyone guess which books I'm, I'm referring to? Jonah. Yes, who said that? Hallelujah. The, the book of Jonah. He was going to the great city of Nineveh. Now take one, look, one good look at me and you see why he didn't want any of my ancestors to be saved. <laughs> right? But thank the Lord that God is not like Jonah. God has a heart for all nations that he created in his image. And he's going to call out a people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And here I am, an Assyrian slave of Jesus Christ. What's the second book? What's the second book? Everyone knows Jonah. The book of Nahum. You guys remember J. Vernon McGee? Ever heard? He's an he's a old-time preacher. He's with the Lord. He used to pronounce these names like the book of Nahum, right? The book of, book of Nahum is also about my ancestors. In Jonah, we got saved. In Nahum, we got destroyed. So those two books are dedicated to my ancestors. And here I am, a living artifact, archaeological proof, those four and him, we are archaeological proof of the truth of the Old Testament because the Assyrians are still alive because Jesus Christ our Lord was faithful to preserve a remnant out of this nation. And that's I stand before you as an Assyrian slave of Jesus Christ. And finally, last but not least, I want to also give <clears throat> glory to God for this brother Ryan. This man here has been used of the Lord to be a great blessing in my life. Currently, I'm going through some trials of the devil to discourage me, but we know that the devil has been crushed under the feet of Jesus Christ. And he that is in us is greater than he in his, in, who's in the world. So Satan can try all he wants. As long as I'm in the hands of the shepherd, he will fail to destroy me because my trust is in Jesus. And the Lord in his goodness raises up people to help you in your time of need. And that brother was one of them. And I thank God for you, Ryan. May he bless you and your family and your little princess and watch over you. You truly are a brother from my heart. And I thank you. I love you, brother. Now that said, are you ready to go home? All right. Now you see here on the screen, praise God, I, over the years I've gotten into a bad habit when, when I teach, I have people read for me. It's a habit I picked up early on because it becomes easier for me just to mention a verse and have someone read it out loud. But thank God for modern technology because we're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Here is the Jehovah Witness official website, jw.org. It's one of the best looking, most professional websites that I've seen. This gives you an idea of their zeal and their passion in trying to promote a gospel that they think is the gospel of Christ, but we know it's no gospel at all. At all. It is a satanic counterfeit. But now look at their zeal. Look, that tells you they're spending money in trying to sell their product, a gospel that they think is the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we know it's satanic at its very core. But look how beautiful it is. We're going to be using this website because I'm going to be using their own translation to try to prove the biblical basis of the Trinity. And I'll explain to you why I want to use their translation. But if you scroll down, brother, thank you. And this is where I need you guys to get your Bibles ready. Get your Bibles ready because time is fleeting. I'm going, I'm going to do my best to cover as much ground as possible by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to the main Bible page, brother. Go back to the main Bible page. Here, online for free, they make available their various editions of their corrupt version of the Bible, as well as, if you scroll down a little more, brother, I don't think he can see me, but if you scroll down, you see right here, it says, the kingdom interlinear translation of the Greek scriptures. Thank God for modern technology, because now they make available their own resources, which you, you can use against them to show how they perverted the scriptures. And one of the best ways of showing a Jehovah Witness that their Bible is perverted is by using their own interlinear Greek New Testament. And we'll see the point in a minute as we delve into the topic. So here online for free, you can access the various Bibles they make available. They also make available the American Standard Version, the Bible in Living English, and the King James Version. 
One of the reasons why they make available the American Standard Version, because this is one of the few English translations where in the Old Testament, the word Jehovah is used repeatedly. In the Old Testament, the word Jehovah is used repeatedly. And the reason why they want to endorse this translation is to show you they didn't come up with the name Jehovah. It's not something unique to Joe's witnesses. Jehovah, Jehovah is a name used by other translations, even by Trinitarians, in reference to the one true God, because they're convinced that in order to be saved, you must know the name of the true God. And so they'll tell you, does God have a name? And they'll ask you, what is it if you know? Now, many people are not comfortable saying the word Jehovah. They're more comfortable in saying Yahweh. I have no problem saying Jehovah because Jehovah is also used in the King James Bible. And contrary to vocab, that heretic, if the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. If you don't got a King James, you need to repent. Amen. Oh. That's why I say you're going to be the greatest church planner in human history. Every church you go to, you divide it into two. Right? Never. No, just kidding. <laughs> Let's go to Exodus chapter 6. Well, you know what? I forgot. Let's not go to Exodus because you don't. How many of you guys have a King James with you? All right. Here's what I want you to do. If you have a King James, you have a King James? All right. He's going to read for me out loud. Go to Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 to 3. Where does the King James translation use the word Jehovah? And a sharp Jehovah witness will point to these passages from the King James translation to show you that the word Jehovah is not unique to the organization. It's not unique to them. They didn't coin the term Jehovah. It was used before there was a Jehovah Witness, before there was a Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So if you go into King James, you'll only see this in the King James, unless you have American Standard Version or the New Jerusalem Bible. In the New Jerusalem Bible, it uses the word Yahweh, Yahweh as opposed to Jehovah. But in Exodus chapter 6, Verses 2 to 3, in the King James, read it out loud for his brothers so they can hear you. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Wait, in verse 3 of the King James Version, Exodus 6, 3, what is God's name? Jehovah. So these are one of the four passages that they'll point to to convince you we didn't come up with the name Jehovah. It's in your King James Bible. And don't forget, for roughly 300 years, the chief English translation of the Bible for English-speaking Christians was the King James. For roughly three, 300 years. And I'm not trying to sell you in the King James, but that's just simply a fact. Until in the 19th century with the rise of modern versions. So this is what they'll do. Another one, Psalm 68, verse 4, and we'll get into the meat of the matter because I'm just laying a foundation because we're going to dive into some meat. And you know I'm not vegetarian. I love meat. I'm a meat eater, so I love spiritual meat, right? Amen? Amen. You didn't say it like you meant it, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 68, verse 4, the King James Version again. How does it render the divine name? Psalm 68, verse 4. Read it for me. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Yes. Stole him that right upon the heavens by his name, Yah. Jah. Jah is the abbreviated form for Jehovah, and this is the King James. It's not the New World Translation. How does he ride the clouds? By the power of his name, Jah. Abbreviation for Jehovah, or what we call the Tetragrammaton. Now, go to Psalm 83, verse 18. Psalm 83, verse 18. And then I'm going to explain briefly what they believe about Jesus Christ and then show you the do's and don'ts of witnessing to Joe's witnesses. Remember, I have a lot to cover in 55 minutes. So that means I have a lot to cover in two and a half hours, Middle Eastern time. Psalm 83, verse 18. That man may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah. Now what translation? Are you sure it's not a Jehovah Witness Bible? It's King James Version, brother. So you're telling me the King James Version uses the word Jehovah as the name of the true God? See, this is where they try to catch you, right? They try to prove to you, see, we didn't come up with the name Jehovah. It's been there in your Bible. That's his name. You must know it. Now, one way, in one area, they're correct. God does have a unique name in the Hebrew Scriptures, right? God's name is not God. 
God's name is not Lord. In fact, the Hebrew terms used for God, Elohim, I'm sure you've heard of it, Il, these were names used for gods and goddesses. These were the names used for the gods and goddesses of the pagans. In fact, the word Elohim is used for da da Dagon, or if you want to say Dagon. In Judges 16, 23, Dagon, or Dagon, the god of the Philistines, he said, he said to be their Elohim. So the word Elohim is not unique to the true God. Neither is the word Lord in Hebrew, Adonai. That's used for others as well. So then how do you differentiate your God from their gods? How do you differentiate your Elohim from their Elohim, your Adonai from their Adonai? And God says, this is how. My name is Yahweh, Yehovah, Jehovah. That's my name to distinguish me from the gods and goddesses of the nations. And that's how you are to know me and call me by. Now, the New Testament changes things quite drastically. The New Testament, and it's ironic, you will not find a single occurrence of the divine name in the Greek New Testament. The New Testament nowhere uses the divine name Jehovah. But here's what's interesting. In the English translation of the Jehovah's Witness Bible, they've inserted the word Jehovah 237 times. Let me repeat that again. In the English translation of the Jehovah's Witness Bible, they have inserted the name Jehovah 237 times without any manuscript basis to do so. They just decided to do it. Let me, let me prove my point. Every one of you, turn in your Bibles to Revelation 1.8. And brother, if you're over there, go to the 2013 edition of the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Go to Revelation 1, verse 8. I hope I'm not boring you yet. If, you, if, you, if you're born now, wait till we're done. In fact, one thing I, I praise God for David Wood, he's the greatest cure for insomnia. Listen to him for five minutes and he'll knock you out. All right. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Now, you don't need to be reading the King James here. You can read some other translation if you want. You have ESV? Okay, ESV. The, the church uses ESV? Of course, man. You guys are five-point Calvinists, baby. <laughs> ESV is the Bible for Calvinists. In fact, if they could invent another five points, they would. It would be the ten points of Calvinists. But anyway, that's another story. ESV, English Standard Version, Revelation 1.8. Now, can you read in ESV? I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. But wait, notice the New World Translation. I am the Alpha and Omega, says Jehovah God. It's right there on the screen. Did you see they substituted the word Lord, which in Greek is uh, Kyrios, if you want to pronounce it the Rasmin way, Kyrios, with Jehovah. I am the Alpha and Omega, says Jehovah God, the one who is and who was, who is coming, the Almighty. Even though, if you go back to the main page, brother, the Bible, the Bible page, I'm going to show you something. Go back to the Bible page. Go to their interlinear. Go back again. Now, go to their interlinear, the kingdom interlinear. You'll see it's right there, the blue one. Yeah, right there. Click on it. Thank God for modern technology. It makes our job so much easier to expose the cults for the glory of the triune God. Here's their own Greek inter, And you don't need to read the Greek. They provide an English translation of the Greek words. Go to Revelation 1.8. Watch here. Revelation 1.8. Here's their own Greek, the Greek they use to produce their English translation. When you click on 1.8, go now to verse 8. We're just going to read the English. You don't need to read the Greek. If you can read the Greek, praise God. I'm the Alpha and Omega say, is saying, Lord. There it is. That's their Greek. The word Jehovah is not there. They inserted it. Do you know why they inserted Jehovah 237 times? In order to indoctrinate brainwash their followers from seeing Jesus as God Almighty. Because if you read Revelation 1-8 without the word Jehovah, that's Jesus speaking, not the Father. But the moment I put the word Jehovah in, then to the Jehovah Witness, that can't be Jesus because he can't be Jehovah. See what they did? You understand how subtle 
deceit is of the enemy? Insert the word Jehovah in the right passages in order to disconnect Jesus from being God Almighty in the flesh. Because if you read the ESV and you read in context, the one who's speaking there is Jesus Christ. He's the one saying, I am the Almighty. Not if you have the Jehovah Witness Bible. Now let me prove to you it's Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Revelation 1, 7 to 8, using the ESV again. Context is king for everything. Now again, if I had time, I would unpack these arguments and solidify these arguments, presenting an irrefutable case that they can't get around. But let me remind you of something. I don't care how strong your case is. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, all you'll do is bring greater judgment on the witness because the more truth he hears and the more he rejects, the greater his judgment. So I don't want to deceive people, and I don't want you to be naive. Your apologetics does not make a person a Christian. Even your evangelism doesn't make a person a Christian unless it is used by the Spirit to open hearts and minds to accept the truth. Because 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3 is quite clear. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. No man can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Spirit of God. And I'm not saying Jesus is Lord in the Jehovah Witness sense. When Paul says Jesus is Lord, he means no man can say Jesus is Jehovah. Because their Lord in that context means Jesus is that Jehovah who became flesh. And I'll prove it to you. Because a lot of people don't know that when Paul tells you that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, he means if you confess that Jesus is Jehovah of the Old Testament. Can I prove that to you guys? Because I know you're a bunch of skeptics and you don't believe Assyrians because you're haters, but that's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> Let's go to Romans 10. Let me show you. Let me prove to you from Romans 10. I will come back to Revelation. I promise you. There's a method to my madness. Uh, to, there's a madness to my... Well, whatever. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Romans 10, verse 9. Let me now conclusively prove from the context. Any good Bible expository preacher will tell you context is king in understanding a passage. Sometimes the context means looking at the entire chapter or looking at the verses before and after or looking at, at that verse in the context of the book as a whole or in the context of all the writings of a particular author. Right? Now in Romans 10 verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, literally it's the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. My question to every one of you is, what does he mean confess Jesus as Lord? In what sense do you confess Jesus as Lord? Meaning your, your master, your sovereign, your owner, or does he mean confess him as Lord in the sense of confessing that he is Jehovah? How do we know? You don't need to guess. Verse 13 tells you. There it tells you what it means to confess Jesus as Lord. Now, by the way, uh, the Jehovah Witness Bible butchers this too. Uh, we're going to read from the ESV, but if you don't mind, brethren, go to their 2013 edition. Go to Romans 10, verse 13 in their edition.
That Jehovah that you need to confess and call on is none other than Jesus. So, Paul, what are you trying to tell me? I'm telling you Jesus is Jehovah. You don't get it? In other words, the confession of the Christian faith isn't simply Jesus is my master. When you say he is Lord, you mean more than master. You mean he is Jehovah who became flesh for my redemption. But here's the problem. Would you have a Jehovah Witness Bible? Look what they do again. Romans 10, 13. Is this Romans 10, 13? Or are you still in Romans 13? Like, man, we can't keep up with you, right? What, what are you at now? Because I have no idea where you guys are at. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, in the New World Translation. That's not Romans 10, verse 13. You're, okay, now let's go to 13. Now notice what they did again. Notice what they did. For whoever calls on the name of Jehovah, there's that word Jehovah again. Why do you think they inserted the word Jehovah? So that their followers who have been indoctrinated to see that Jehovah is the Father alone will not make the connection between Jesus as Jehovah. Because right now for a Jehovah Witness, you know what he just read? I have to call on the name of the Father to be saved. But you say, hold on, Jehovah Witness. Verse 9 says, no, it's Jesus who you call on as Lord. Why the disconnect from 9 to 13 when it's the same context, the same point? Why are you shredding the scriptures in this manner to avoid the plain teaching of the Bible? Jesus is your Jehovah. Because once you buy into a system that tells you it's God's mouthpiece on earth, then that system tells you what the Bible can and cannot mean. And so the society has already told its followers, Jesus can't be Jehovah, so it can't mean that. It's got to be the Father. Now, here's what's beautiful. Is the word Jehovah in their own Greek interlinear? Go back to the interlinear. Let's look at this. Let's go to their interlinear. Here's what's beautiful. Let's go to the interlinear. Thank you, Lord, for using even this website to destroy this cult and bring you glory. You see how amazing God is? God is so sovereign, he's even left a witness of himself in this corrupt Bible and corrupt organization. And you tell me God ain't sovereign? What an amazing God we serve, right? Romans 10, click on it in the Greek, Romans 10. Does the Greek have the word Jehovah? Okay, now go down to verse 13. Now here, we're just going to read the English. Everyone for who likely might call upon the name of Lord. Kiriu. The word Jehovah is not even in their Greek. The word Jehovah is not even in their English translation of their Greek. So then why did you insert the word Jehovah? In order to deceive people from the truth of who Jesus is. But if you see it for what it is, now notice the word, 13, it says, Kiriu, that's Lord. Go back to verse 9. Who is that Lord, Kiriu, in verse 9? Now watch here, verse 9. That if ever you should confess the saying in the mouth of you, the Lord, Hati Kirius Jesus, he is the Kiriu, he is the Kirius, he is the Lord that you call on. It's inescapable from the Greek. This is why you have to get familiar with their resources to use it by the power of the Holy Spirit against them until every Jehovah Witness knee bows and every Jehovah Witness mouth confesses, Jesus, you are Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. So God has made evangelism very easy for those who have a heart to reach the lost. He made it easy. I mean, look how easy he made it for us. We just need to use the resources that God has made available for his glory. Now, that said, let's go back to Revelation. Let me make that point, and we'll talk a little bit about what they believe about Jesus and how to use their Bible, the do's and don'ts of witnessing. Now, I don't know what time I started. What time did I start? What was it? I love this guy. You need to leave L.A. and come move here. All right? All right. Yeah, I, don't, I really don't know what time I started, but the pastor looks like he likes me. All right? He's like, he's smiling. He's like, he's loving me. Thank you, brother. For that, I'm going to do Halal Hogan for you at the end. <laughs> brother, I'll be there. All right, all right. Before I leave, I'm going to do Halal Hogan. All right. And now, Revelation 1, 7 to 8. I said, if you read a translation that doesn't insert the word Jehovah, the context makes it clear. Jesus is the one speaking as the Alpha and Omega. Context is king. You can't do that in a Jehovah Witness Bible unless you use their interlinear. But now you're going to see why they inserted the word Jehovah. Very sneaky. 
And you can see that the origin of this translation is satanic. It's diabolical. You know Satan moved this organization to pr produce such a perverted Bible translation. But because God is greater than the devil, even in his perverted Bible, God has left a witness. And I'm going to show you. But let's read Revelation 1, 8 in the ESV. And we're going to start at verse 7. No, you guys don't need You can just stay there for now, and I'll tell you when to turn. Revelation 1, let's read verse 7 carefully to see who in the context is speaking to John as the Alpha and Omega, the Almighty. Revelation 1, let's start at verse 7. Read for me, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. Now, if I ask you who's coming according to that verse, how do you know? It didn't say Jesus. Well, the Father also comes in the clouds. Think about it. It's right there. It's in the verse. It tells you it can't be the Father. Those who pierced him. So, Jehovah's Witness, was the Father pierced? No. Was the Holy Spirit pierced? No, only the Son. So who's coming? Notice John says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So the one coming is the one who's pierced. That's when you start verse 8. Now let's connect verse 8 with verse 7. Who's now speaking? The one who's coming. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come. According to verse 7, the one coming is the one pierced, the Almighty. You don't get any clearer. That's Jesus Christ claiming to be the Almighty. Clear? Not if you use the Jehovah Witness translation. Because they inserted the word Jehovah. And why is that important? Why do I hammer the point? Jehovah's Witnesses are conditioned that when they hear the word Jehovah, their mind has been programmed to think Father alone. So when you say to a Jehovah Witness, Jesus is God, you just said to the Jehovah Witness, Jesus is the Father. Because they don't define terms the way you do. See, when I say to a bunch of Trinitarians, Jesus is God, this is what ran in your mind. Second person of the Trinity, not the Father, not the Spirit who became flesh. That's already in your mind. Do you actually think Jehovah Witnesses share that assumption? When you say to a Jehovah Witness, Jesus is God, what he heard you say is he's the Father. How can he be the Father? Was he praying? To? Because they don't define the words the way you do. So one of the ways not to witness to Joe's witnesses is simply throw out words assuming they share the same definition that you do. You can't just simply say Jesus is God. You are miscommunicating to a Jehovah's Witness. So you're going to have to be able to enter their mindset, put yourself in their shoes and see how they define these terms, and then present the gospel in a manner where you don't miscommunicate. And that's exactly how Jesus preached. Is it a coincidence that Jesus never came out, if you read the Gospels, he never came out and said, I am God, in those exact words? I challenge anyone to read the four Gospels, show me a single place where Jesus says in the exact words, I am God. He never does. Do you know why? Because the Jews, similar to the Jews' witnesses, assume God is the Father in heaven. So for Jesus to say to a Jew in the first century, I am God, that Jew would have understood him to say that he's the Father in heaven. And he's not. So then, what way could Jesus communicate to the Jews, though I'm not the Father, I'm still God, the way he does in the Gospels. He claims to be the Son in such a manner where he's one with the Father, but distinct from him, and they got it. Oh, so clearly you're not the Father, but you still make yourself out to be God. So we're getting what you're saying. You're not the Father, but you're claiming to be God. Blasphemy! And let me prove it to you. Let's go to John 10. John 10. Am I putting you to sleep yet? I'm trying to do what David Wood does best, put people to sleep. It's not working. All right, let's go to John 10. Let me show you. John 10, and we're going to use the Jehovah Witness Bible. Well, no, we're not going to use it. Yeah, yeah, let's use it. We're going to use both versions because another thing that the Jehovah Witness translation suffers from, it's, I call it, other -sitis. It's more dangerous than the coronavirus. It's called other -sitis. And also, the Jehovah Witness translation suffers from what I call the lo lower case G syndrome. Lower case G syndrome. What do I mean? You will find quite often verses that you quote to prove Jesus is God. In their Bible, they translate it as a God, lowercase g. 
So I call this the lowercase g syndrome. Like in John 1.1, 1, 1, their translation says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was a God. They do it in John 10.33. For the sake of time, ESV, John 10, 33. And brethren, if you can go to John 10, 33, this is what I call lowercase g syndrome and other situs. It's a disease found all throughout the Jehovah's Witness Bible. So another rule of witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses, you have to be familiar with the translation to know what verses not to quote. Let me repeat that again. If you want to be effective to the Jehovah's Witness, you need to know their Bible translation with such familiarity that you know what verses to avoid in discussion. And because I'm familiar, I know what verses not to turn to. So I know not to turn to John 1, because John 1 would then entail a lengthy exposition of the Greek. Now, how many of you have time to break down the Greek for a Jehovah's Witness? Let's be honest. Right? Thank you. So avoid those controversial passages and go to the passages where they translate it correctly, at least for this version. I'm assuming that in later versions, when enough people start using these passages, they're going to mistranslate them too, right? Because that's their pattern. Now, what do I mean? In John 10.33 ESV, how does it read? John 10.33 ESV, how does it read? Read out loud. The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we, that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now, do you want to see this disease called lowercase g? This is lowercase g syndrome? Look at their translation. The Jews answered him, we are stoning you not for a fine work, but for blasphemy. For you, although being a man, make yourself a God. Do you see it? A God, lowercase g. This is what I call the lowercase g syndrome. It's a disease, right? Right. Now, but I want to show you how Jesus in this chapter claimed to be God without claiming to be the Father, and the Jews got it. Let's put this translation aside for now. Most people will quote John 10.30. I am the Father one. Not good enough, folks. John 10.30, and when Christians do it, I understand either it's because they think it's sufficient to prove their case, but a sharp anti-Trinitarian is ready to refute you. When you quote John 10, 30, I and the Father one, he's ready to take you to John 17, 11. Well, the disciples are one as Jesus is one with God. So does that make them God? So they're ready for you. They're studying your arguments to refute you, but you're not studying their objections to refute them for the glory of Christ. Because Paul says we demolish every argument in order to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. How are you going to demolish arguments if you don't know what their arguments are? How are you going to do that? You don't start at John 10.30. When you want to prove that Jesus is claiming to be God but not the Father, you do not start at verse 30. You start at 27. Let's break it down. You ready? John 10, 27 to 30. Now, remember what I said. Jesus, being the perfect communicator, knew what to say and what not to say in order to make sure that his audience got the point. I'm not the Father, but I'm God, one with him. Right? So he knew his audience, and he knew how to communicate his deity perfectly because he's the God-man and the perfect speaker. So let's learn from his example how not to witness and how to witness. Now notice, they're going to get it. You're not the Father, but you are a man claiming to be God. That we got. You're not the Father, but you're a man claiming to be God, and that's unheard of because only the Father is God, and God isn't a man. And Jesus says, surprise, surprise. No, the Father is not the only one who's God. There's another who is God, and he did become man, namely me, his son. Now, how did he do it? John 10, 27, 28. Read that for me. John 10, 27, 28. See, I'm putting him to sleep. You know, he's yawning. What a hater, bro. I just praised you. My goodness. This is the last time you're coming. No, I'm kidding. John 10, 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Okay, if you like to underline your Bibles or mark them up, Underline, my sheep, my voice. My sheep, my voice. Underline that. Right? And I know them. So my sheep, my voice. And then keep going. And I know them, and they follow me. Keep going. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Yes. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Underline, I give them everlasting life, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. So let's, let's again, repeat what Jesus just said. My sheep 
hear my voice, I give them everlasting life, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Now let's compare the language of Jesus with the Old Testament. Are you ready? No one can snatch them out of my hand. They are my sheep to hear my voice. Go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. <clears throat> And let's read 6 to 8. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Guys, remember the words of Christ. Let it echo in your ears. My sheep, my voice. Right? My sheep, my voice. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And I get, okay, now let's see why. That's significant. Psalm 95, 6 to 8 in the ESV. Read out loud for me, brother. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Wait, wait, wait. The sheep of His hand. My sheep in my hand. Today, if you hear His voice, and they hear my voice. Did you make the connection? Jesus just sounded like he's uh, as if he's the God of the psalmist. The psalmist says, we are the sheep in his hand, and we are to hear his voice. And Jesus says, they are my sheep in my hand, and they hear my voice. Who do you think you are? Why are you taking the language of the Old Testament and applying it to yourself? Who do you think you are? God in the flesh. But what are the two other things? I give them everlasting life. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Is it too hot on you guys? You're okay. Nothing, do I can, you know, nothing I can do about the heat. Unless it's my good looks. Just, no, I'm just kidding. All right. Deuteronomy 32, 39. In the SV. Deuteronomy 32, 39 in the SV. Read out loud. See now that I, even I, am he. I am he. And there is no God beside me. Mm -hmm. I kill and I make alive. I make alive. And Jesus says, I give everlasting life. Here's the proof that I, Jehovah, alone am God. I alone make alive. But Jesus says, wait, I give them everlasting life. And there are none who can deliver out of my hand. Jesus says, no one can deliver out of my hand. Who do you think you are? Why do you speak as if you're the God of the Old Testament? Why are you claiming the prerogatives that makes God God in distinction from creation? Who do you think you are, Jesus of Nazareth? I am God in the flesh, but I'm not the Father. Do you see the language? Was it clear? This man is speaking as if he's the God of the Old Testament, and they're getting it. But does that mean that they thought he's claiming to be the Father? No, this is where verse 29 comes in. My Father, who's given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then that's when he says, I and my Father are one. That's the context. The context is not verse 30. It's 27 to 30. I am one with my Father in our ability to preserve the sheep incorruptible, and there's no power that can ever pluck the sheep out of our hands because I'm one with the Father. I'm just as mighty as he is in preserving the flock. That's when the stones come out. Now, okay, you just claim to be God in the flesh, though you're not the Father. Who do you think you are? God in the flesh who's not the Father. Hello? You see? What's beautiful about the original language, so you don't see it in the English, and this passage, by the way, destroys modalism, a heresy masquerading as Christianity. Let's let the Jehovah Witness interlinear help us here. John 10.30. If you go to the interlinear, John 10.30. Here's what's beautiful. The verb are in your English language, you don't see it in the English, but in the Greek, it's esmen. Esmen, it's plural. It's we are, showing they're not one person. We are one. So I'm not the Father. The Father's not I. We're distinct, but we're one in our power and ability. So notice how he communicates his deity perfectly. He just clearly said, I am not the Father. Okay, we got that. You're not the Father. But like the Father, I am God who can do only what God does. That's where you're blaspheming. Because as far as we're concerned, the Father alone is God. And Jesus says, well, here, let me let you in on a little surprise. He's not the only one who's God. His son, I, am also God with him, along with the Holy Spirit. And here, John 10, 30, well, here, uh, you see where it says? And they even translate the plural for you. You see it says, we are esmen. It's hen, esmen. That's plural. Not we are the same person, 
We're not. We're two distinct persons. That's why it's plural. We are one in our ability to preserve the flock. You don't get any more clear in communicating the fact Jesus is not the Father, but he is just as almighty as the Father is because he's one with him in essence who became flesh. See? So why didn't Jesus just come out and say, I'm God? That would have miscommunicated. Just like if you say to a Jehovah Witness, hey, Jesus is Jehovah. You know what you told the Jehovah Witness? Hey, Jesus is the Father. And they're scratching their head. How can he be the Father? What are you talking about, man? Who's he praying to? Who sent him? Right? Why would he say the Father is greater than I? How can it's Because they don't define language the way you do. So one rule is know how to communicate your belief effectively to the person that you're sharing the gospel with. If he's a Muslim, think like a Muslim. Share the gospel in a way that a Muslim can understand it. Jehovah's Witness, think like a... Put yourself in their shoes if you really want to see them get saved and be an effective tool in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Before I move on to the next point, I'm going to keep asking, because even though I was joking about two hours, it's 9.18, how, long, how much more time? So I can time myself. Pastor's saying, don't even ask me, brah. Today you're going to lock up the church. Okay. Who is that? My man. I love you, man. I'm going to see a lot more of you because I live here now, right? Anyway. I should have told you what they believe about Jesus Christ. Let me put that in perspective, because this is all preparatory. The Jehovah Witness believe, and some of you already know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but when I actually found out the specific details of their belief, it blew me away. I thought I knew what they believed. He's the Archangel Michael. It gets a little more complicated. If you ask a Jehovah Witness, who's the first creature that God made? They'll say the Archangel Michael. Well, who's the Archangel Michael? He's the human Jesus. But here's where it gets baffling. In Jehovah Witness theology, the Archangel Michael ceased to exist when the human Jesus was conceived in the womb of his mother. So God took the life force of the Archangel Michael and his memories and implanted it in that human seed. But Archangel Michael ceased to exist when the human Jesus came into being. So he wasn't an angel in the flesh. He was just a man with the memories of Michael and the life force of Michael, whatever that means. What does it mean he has the life force of Michael? <laughs> Good luck in trying to get a Joe witness to explain what that means. But as far as they're concerned, when the human Jesus came into existence, Michael ceased to be. So then what's the connection? I thought he is Michael. He had the memories of Michael and the life force of Michael, but he wasn't Michael. He was just a man, Jesus. That's what they believe. Don't take my word for it. Ask them. You think that's confusing and baffling? What happened when Jesus died? Michael was recreated and the man Jesus disappeared. There is no more man Christ Jesus. It's now the Archangel Michael who is recreated with the memories of the human Jesus. There is no Jesus in Jehovah Witness theology. He's gone. This is what they believe. Don't take my word for it. Ask them. So is Archangel Michael Jesus? Is he the actual human Jesus? They'll say no. He's the spirit creature, the Archangel Michael, who was recreated with the memories of the human Jesus. So in Jehovah Witness theology, Jesus is dead and gone. He does not exist. That's what they believe. Is it sinking in or no? Some of you are just looking at me and saying, when is the guy going to finish? Or is it like you're shocked? I don't know what it is, right? <laughs> is it shock or is it, I don't know, because you're like. It's good, it's good. All right. There is no Jesus Christ in Jehovah Witness theology, though they'll use the name Jesus. Though they'll use the name Jesus, Jesus the man is gone. It's now the Archangel Michael recreated and exalted to a higher status with the memories of the human Jesus. That's what they believe. Does that sound like your Jesus? So their God is not your God, their Jesus is not your Jesus, and their spirit is not the spirit you believe in. But this is what they believe. So this is what they believe. Now, how do we show them they're wrong? The do's and don'ts of witnessing to Joe's witnesses. Number one, try as much as you can to use their Bible against them and know what passages to cite and what passages not to cite. Let me give you an example. Some of the most powerful passages showing that Jesus is God deliberately mistranslated in the New World Translation. I'll just give you, oh yeah, let me give you John 1.18, because ESV would read only God. John 1.18, can you go to John 1.18 in the New World Translation? John 1.18, in the New World Translation? And then we're going to read ESV. 
Remember I said you had other situs going on, that disease called other situs and the lowercase g syndrome? You're going to see it again. All right. John 1.18 in the SV translates the, the Greek words monogenes theos in a very amazing manner. If you read the SV, the two words, monogenes theos, are rendered only God. So Jesus is said to be the only God. Powerful! Now, some would debate the translation of monogenes, but that's irrelevant. Let's put that aside. In your translation, ESV, it will say, if you want to read it, read it from ESV. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's The English, side. yes. He has made Him. No one has seen God, what? Read it again. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Powerful, isn't it? Jesus is the only capital G God. Powerful witness to His deity. Not if a Jehovah's Witness reads it from his translation. So learn what passages not to quote so you don't get into a debate on Greek grammar, syntax. Do you really have time to go into the Greek grammar and you think they're going to trust you? Because the Joel Witnesses are taught one thing. I thought I brought my Bible. Did I bring the Joel Witnesses? Anyway, forget it's over there. Joel Witnesses, Bible, uh, Joel Witnesses are taught you have the little flock and the great crowd. The little flock of 144,000 anointed. They alone know the interpretation of the Bible. And the great crowd needs them to tell you what the Bible means. That's what they're taught. They'll tell you the Bible was not written for the masses. It was written for the 144,000. They alone know what it means, so you need them to tell you what it means. So Now, if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're taught, only the anointed class can tell me what the Bible means, and here you are, you're not even a Jehovah's Witness, let alone part of the anointed class, and you're now telling him what the Bible means. He's going to look at you with suspicion. This guy's of the devil. He won't listen to you. He's been taught this man is an agent of the devil. He's part of corrupt Christendom. There's no way he can know the Bible because he's not part of the anointed class. See, that's what they're taught, right? So when you tell a Jehovah's Witness this is what it means, they've shut you down. There's no way you can tell me what it means because you can't know because you're not anointed and it's not for you, it's for them to tell us what it means. With that said, John 1.18, notice here, notice their translation. Your translation said only God, capital G. Notice their translation. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten, lowercase g, God. Now, what do you think ha will happen when you quote John 1.18 and they turn to their Bible? They're going to say, yeah, yeah, see? He's an only begotten God, a lowercase g God created by Jehovah. So what are you trying to prove to me? No, no, it doesn't say that. My Bible says, well, your Bible is corrupt. This is the only perfect translation because it's produced by the anointed class. And they got it right. So I don't waste my time. I don't quote John 1.18 because I don't have time to go into Greek grammar as if they're going to listen to me. Once I start talking Greek, they're going to say, oh, there goes a mouthpiece of the devil. Shut them out. Never come back. Put a mark on this house. Don't come back here. So if you're trying to win the argument and not the heart, then argue and destroy their argument. But if you want to win their heart, don't argue. Ask questions and let them think and probe. Never tell them what it means. Ask them questions to start thinking and questioning. Man, that was a good question. Yeah, he's got a point here, and this response that the society's, it's not an effective response. So, again, I'm trying to hammer, know how to use the Bible in your witness to Joe's witnesses, so know the passages to avoid. Like John 1.18, I never quote this to prove the deity of Christ. Because now I've got to convince them Jesus is not a lowercase g God. Do you think I have time? Or John 10, 33. You, O man, make yourself out to be a God. I don't quote that. Now, I'm going to give you other examples. Let's go to Acts 20, 28 in the ESV. I think the ESV translates as like the NIV. I don't know. I haven't used the ESV in a while. But I'm going to show you passages to avoid and passages to use, and then we'll wrap up. Maybe I'll take a few minutes on questions, if that's, if that's okay with you guys, if you want. Like I said, I can be here till 2 in the morning. I'm a lonely person. I need a lot of love and attention. <laughs> Anytime I'm invited, I try to take advantage of the time because I need a lot of love. Can you tell me I'm great, please? <laughs> All right. Okay. look. Is the SV says it? That he purchased with his own blood? Does it say it there? Oh, beautiful. ESV. Acts 20, 28 in the New World Translation. Look, now this will work 
for those who are not raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, believing their Bible is the best translation. Quoting Acts 20, 28, powerful witness to the two natures of Christ. Acts 20, 28 is one of the most powerful witnesses to the fact that Jesus is God and human, two natures, one person, not if you are witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness. In Acts 20, 28, read it for us in the ESV. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. God has blood? No. God has blood? Yes. This heretic is saying no. You ready to become a Jehovah Witness? What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> yeah, God has blood. <laughs> You're scaring me, bro. I think we brought you here to expose you, man. A secret Assyrian Jehovah Witness. Talk about an oxymoron right there, right? Right? Yes, God has blood. It said it. God purchased the church by his blood. This clearly is a reference to Jesus as God and human. He is God who became human and shed his human blood to purchase the church. Clear, right? Everyone see it clear? Not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. You can see it over there. Here's the Jehovah Witness Bible. Pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit. And by the way, did you notice the Holy Spirit, the H and the S is lowercase? Because they don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person, so they put it lowercase deliberately. Right there. Which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to shepherd the congregation of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. Guess what, folks? Even the Greek that they use, the word son is not there. They added it. So in their translation, it isn't God that shed his blood to purchase the church. God purchased the church with the blood of his own son. But wait, Mr. Witness, when I go to your interlinear, let's go to their Greek. Are you guys okay that I'm navigating with their translations? Are you guys with that to show you? Yeah, right. What better way to show you than use their own sources, right? Wait, Mr. Witness, when I go to your Greek interlinear, the word son is not in the Greek. Why would you insert it? We know why, right? Why do you think they would insert a word that's not in the Greek? To rob Jesus of the glory of his deity. Acts 20, 28, let's keep going. You're going to see it here. You don't need to read the Greek, just read the English, go down. Okay, right here. Be you paying attention to selves and to all the flock, right? <clears throat> in which you, the Spirit, the Holy, put overseers to be shepherding the ecclesia. I don't know why they didn't translate that. And notice they never use the word church in their translation, by the way. They never use the word church because they believe churches are part of a corrupt satanic system. So they translated congregation. That's why even their churches, they're not called churches, they're called kingdom halls. They don't like to use the word church because of its association with corrupt Christendom. So notice, ecclesia of the God, which he reserved for self through the blood of the one. Where's the word son? Where's the word son? It's not even in their Greek. Let me give you a couple more examples, and then I'll give you one example where then you can use their Bible to prove that Jesus is Jehovah God, and then we'll open up a couple minutes for the questions. Let's go to, what translation should I use here? Titus 2.13. Yep, Titus 2.13. The English, Titus 2.13. There's so many I can give you, but I just want you to see this pattern. These are the verses I never use in my witness to Joe's witnesses. I never use these passages because I'm aware their Bible mistranslate, and I don't have time to spend an hour going into the Greek grammar. And so in grammatically, for example, Titus 2.13, and you'll hear this, a Granville Sharp construction. And because of this Greek rule, right, that Granville Sharp discovered, he discovered six rules on how the Greek New Testament uses the definite article the. In his first rule, it clearly establishes that Titus 2.13 is calling Jesus the great God and Savior. Now, do you really think a Joe Witness is going to give me 20 minutes to unpack the Granville Sharp rule? You actually think he's going to sit there and say, oh, yeah, can you tell me about Granville Sharp and how it proves my society satanic? Please, I'm all ears. <laughs> so avoid passages that are controversial because of mistranslation and go to the clear-cut ones that they've even translated correctly. And I'm going to give you two examples from their translation to whet your appetite to go deeper into the subject. Deeper into the subject. Now, in the ESV, Titus 2.13, how does it read? Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow! Jesus is our great God and Savior. And for a Jew, the only great God is Jehovah. So Paul just identified Jesus as Jehovah. 
not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Look how it reads. While we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, they make it seem as it's referring to two persons. The great God and Jesus Christ, our Savior. So now, do you have time to unpack the Granville Sharp rule to show them that this is a mistranslation? And do you think they want to hear your arguments? So avoid these. Now, let me give you an example. One example of other situs, what I call other situs, and then show you some verses that you can use to prove the Trinity deity of Christ. Now, again, this would entail a series of lessons to walk you through the use of the Jehovah Witness Bible. I don't have that. So I'm hoping to whet your appetite that you begin the journey. If you really feel God has called you to witness to the witnesses, you got to know their sources. And I can show you from their sources clear, irrefutable evidence from their own Bible, Jesus is Jehovah, and they can't get around it. But remember what I said, you can give them an irrefutable case, that still doesn't mean they will see unless the Holy Spirit opens their minds. So what you need to do is, Holy Spirit, please use these verses from their Bible to open their hearts and bring them to the feet of Jehovah Jesus. Not this fake Archangel Michael that they think is Jesus, who doesn't exist, but Jehovah Jesus, because Christ has a people even from the Jehovah's Witnesses that he's going to redeem for his glory, if you believe that, right? Or you believe that there are no elect among the Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you believe that, how would you know? Are you claiming extra biblical revelation? Then we're going to stone you, you heretic. No, I'm just kidding. Let's put that aside. Now, let's go to Philippians 2, verse 9. Other Sidus. This is now an example of other Sidus. And then I'm going to show you some of the verses you can use effectively, and then I'll open up to Q&A by the grace of God. Philippians 2, verse 9, in the ESV, how does it read? Philippians 2, verse 9, in the ESV, read out loud. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Does your translation say every name? Jesus has been given the name that's higher than every name? Not according to the Jehovah Witness. For this very reason, God exalted his superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. So Jesus doesn't possess the highest name imaginable, which would be the name Jehovah. He possesses a name that's higher than every other name because there's still one name higher than his, the name Jehovah, because he's not Jehovah. Do you see the word other? Or am I making it up? You see the word other? Right? Guess what? It's not in their Greek. Boy, do I love their interlinear. It destroys the satanic organization. Go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. One of the most powerful passages proving Jesus is the eternal creator of all creation. Not if you read a Jehovah Witness Bible. Colossians 1, 16 to 17. Colossians, we're almost done, folks. I hope I didn't torture you too much. You guys okay? Man, I love you, bro. My man. Colossians 1, 16, 17. We're not going to read in the New World Translation yet. Colossians 1, 16, 17, ESV. Look how powerful a witness this is to Christ being eternal, uncreated, almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. Pay attention to the language. And it's talking about Christ. If you start at 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all or of all creation. Then it says in 16, why is he the firstborn? Read 16. For by him all things were created. Some things. In heaven. Wait, before you go on. Some things. All things. Most things? All things. Well, hold on, brother. Now, I'm, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I am smarter than David Wood. That's another point. Here's what I want to ask you. If it says Jesus created all things, meaning all creation, that means Jesus existed before all creation, right? But if he existed before all creation, then he's not a creature, is he? Because the only thing you have before creation is eternity. So you're telling me that here Paul's saying Jesus is eternal because he created all things, which means he's older than all creation, which means he's not part of creation. That's what Paul is saying? Absolutely. Now finish it. All things were made by him, created by him. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So wait, all things? All things. But what about verse 17, though, man? You missed out 17, you, you secret Jehovah Witness, you? Verse 17. 
and he is before all things. Now, right there, if I tell you Jesus is before all creation, because all things is all creation, can you get any clearer that Jesus is uncreated? If I say Jehovah is before all things, no Jehovah Witness would be confused as to the point. They would understand I'm saying he's before all creation because he's uncreated. But Paul said that about Jesus. He is before all things. And in Jesus, in him, all things consist. He sustains everything. You don't get more clear than what Paul wrote, that Jesus is the almighty creator and sustainer of all creation. Not if you read a Jehovah Witness Bible. Notice their translation. Go to Colossians 1, 16 to 17. Remember I said other Citus? Colossians 1, 16 to 17. Are you there in Colossians 1? I think you are. Come, yeah, yeah, go down. 16. Now watch. Watch their translation. Because by means of him, all other things were created. Can you highlight the word other, brother? They inserted the word other four times in this translation. All other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. He is before all other things, and by means of him all other things were made to exist. Four times they inserted the word other in a text that clearly shouts, Jesus is no creature, he's uncreated, he's God Almighty. Four times they inserted the word other. But thank God for their Greek. Let me show you their Greek. Now let's go to the Greek interlinear. And then we're going to end it with one example, how their Bible can be used to prove the deity of Christ. And I'm just going to give you one of dozens of passages that you can use, but for the sake of time, I'll just give you one. That actually even works with Muslims, but I'd have to unpack this, but that's all right. Go to Colossians 1. It actually works with Muslims. I don't know if we have a Quran. Any of you guys with a Quran? You guys came to church without a Quran? What kind of Christians are you? <laughs> Colossians, yeah, let's go to Colossians 1. It's the last time I'm coming to this church. No Quran in the church? What's wrong with you guys, man? <laughs> Colossians 1.16. Notice the Greek. Can you show me where the word other is in their Greek? This is their Greek. Because in him it was created the all things. Tapanta. There's no other. They're Greek. Tapanta, all things. In the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible, the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, the all things. Do you see the word other in their Greek? It's tapanta, all things. All things through him and into him it has been created. And he is before all things, pro panton. And the all things in him has stood together. How dare you add the word other four times when even your own Greek interlinear exposes your corruption and fraud? Do you want more proof that this Bible is diabolical and that Satan's fingerprints are all over it? If there was one Bible that I could say was satanically produced, it's this Bible. Because you see the deliberate, systematic attack on the Trinity and the glory of Jesus Christ. You know that's from the pit of hell. You know that's from Satan because he wants to rob Jesus of his glory. But instead of seeing Joe's witnesses as the enemies, may your heart break for them because they are victims of the enemy. They are victims deceived by the enemy, and you are the only thing that stands between them and hell. Right? So clearly, you can use their own sources to show the deliberate, shameful butchering of the Bible. Okay, how do I then now use the Bible, their Bible, their perversion, to my advantage? I'll just give you one example for the sake of time. And believe me when I tell you, I can be here for days giving you example after example. No exaggeration. I'm not lying. But for the sake of time, unless you guys don't want to sleep and you want to fast from sleeping, and some of you do need beauty sleep, so I don't want to rob you of that, but no, I'm kidding. Let me give you one example. Let's go to Isaiah 44, verse 6. And this works with Muslims, by the way. You know? Isaiah 44. Now, we're just going to use the New World Translation. We don't need to use the ESV. New World Translation will be good enough because now I'm showing you how to use their Bible to your advantage. How to use their Bible to your advantage. Okay? So we're just going to use the New World Translation. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6. This is what Jehovah says. The King of Israel. Notice how they translate certain words. Repurchaser. 
repurchaser. He repurchased you, right? I mean, weird way of translating the word redeem, but that's okay. The king of Israel, his repurchaser, Joe of armies, I am the first and I am the last. There's no God but me. I am the first and I am the last, okay? Pay attention to what Joe is saying. I am the first, I am the last. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Let's go there. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Watch here. We're just going to use their translation. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I have called. I am the same one. I am the first, I am also the last. So who's the first and the last? Jehovah, right? What does it mean when it says Jehovah is the first? See, it's not enough just to quote a verse. You've got to understand the implication of these titles. What does Jehovah mean when he says, I am the first and the last? What does he mean? You don't need to guess. He explains it in Isaiah 41, verse 4. In Isaiah 41, verse 4, he tells you what he means. So, Jehovah, what do you mean that you're the first and last? Let me explain it. Isaiah 41, verse 4, New World Translation. Is this Bible amazing or what? Not their Bible. I'm just saying the Bible. Right? It's an, when you read the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit, you stand in awe. You see clearly this is the word of the true God. And Jesus is risen. He's alive. And we will see him. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. Isaiah 41, verse 4. Read this. Who has acted and done this? Summoning the generations from the beginning. I created the generations from the beginning. I, Jehovah, am the first one. And with the last ones, I am the same. He explained it. I've been with the first generation, and I'll be with the very last generation. Did you catch what he just said? With the very first generation, I'm there. I've been with the first one, and I'll be with the last ones. So what does it mean for Jehovah to be the first last? It means he's been there from the start, at the very beginning of creation, with the first generation of humans, and he's going to continue to be with every subsequent generation of humans till the end of the age. It is simply another way of saying that Christ is timeless, or I should say Jehovah, and Jesus is Jehovah, that God is timeless. He's not bound to time, space, and place. Because he's timeless, he was there from the beginning, will remain with us to the end of the age, because unlike us, he's not bound to time. In other words, it's simply another way of saying Jesus is eternal. I keep saying Jesus because, you know, I'm a Trinitarian. Jehovah is eternal. We know it's Jesus, but you want to get them to see that. So you get them to see, hey, who's the first last? Jehovah. Chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. For those of you who witness the Muslims. Chapter 57, verse 3, it says, he, Allah, is the first and the last. Chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. Right? It says, Allah is the first. So at least the Quran got something right. The title first and last is the title of deity, even though the Allah of the Quran is a false god. So you, you can use this for the Muslims. Say, hey, Muslim, who's the first and the last? Allah! Allah Akbar. Right? And then David does another Muhammad boom boom room. Okay? Allah Akbar! Okay? Jehovah Witness, who's the first and the last? Jehovah! Then I go to Revelation 117. I don't read 18. And I love the reaction when I see it. <laughs> In me power. Now the, Revelation 117. Here's what I do. Okay, okay, so you agree it's Jehovah, right? Jehovah Witness? You agree, Muslima? Allah? All right. Revelation 117, watch this. Revelation 117, in their Bible, using their Bible. This is what I'm trying to show you, how to use their Bible. Okay, Revelation 117. I don't read 18 yet. I'll either read 117 or have them read it. Jehovah Witness, I'll say, hey, Revelation 117. When I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet, and he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. So I pause. Who's the first and last? Automatically, they'll say Jehovah. If it's a Muslim, they'll say Allah. And then I say, when did Jehovah die? What do you mean? Verse 18. And the living one and became dead. And look, I'm living forever and ever. When did Jehovah die? Jehovah didn't die, Jesus did. But you just said that's Jehovah speaking. Thank you for admitting Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. And Muslim, stop saying Allahu Akbar, say Al-Masihu Akbar, the Messiah is greater. Because you just admit Jesus claimed to be God.
That's one of the many ways you can use their Bible to your advantage. I wish I had more time. I can show you a lot more that's even clearer than this and how to respond to their objections to your arguments. But at the end of the day, remember. Remember how to witness to Joe's witnesses, how not to witness Joe's wit to, uh, Jehovah's witnesses. Be familiar with their Bible to avoid these pitfalls of quoting the wrong passages. Let me give you a true story. What I mean by knowing their Bible enough not to quote the wrong passage. In the 90s, when I was first getting into apologetics, I went to a kingdom hall in Chicago, and I was debating this Spanish Joe witness who was, you know, most, for the most part, Joe's witnesses are good people. They're nice people if you meet them. This guy was a jerk. He actually made me want to do a body slam and, you know, just like get into my Hulkamania, you know, because he was so nasty, honestly, you know, just rude. So I said, hey, I'll prove to you Jesus is God. So I had my King James Bible. 1 Timothy 3.16. I read it. Go to 1 Timothy 3.16, folks, if you can, brethren, uh, in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. I read it in the King James. And it says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I go, see? God was manifest in the flesh. He opened up his Bible, 1 Timothy 3.16. Before the rapture, guys, I don't want to leave you behind. I'm kidding. 1 Timothy 3.16, if you got nobody there. Did they leave? Man, they probably left us behind. Did they get raptured? Oh, they're here? Okay. You scared me, bro. I thought it was the last trumpet. 1 Timothy 3, 16. Now, the King James says God was manifest in the flesh. He opened his Bible, and he embarrassed me. Here's their translation. Indeed, the sacred secret of this godly devotion is admittedly great. He was made manifest in the flesh. There's no God. And I looked at his Bible, and I was embarrassed because I quoted the wrong passage, thinking his Bible read the same way. See, these are the pitfalls you must avoid. Be familiar with their Bible to know what to quote and what not to quote. And another thing, don't tell them what it means. Ask them questions. Because the moment you tell them what it means, they will shut you out. There's no way you can know what it means. You're not part of the anointed class. You're not even a Jehovah's Witness. There's no way you can know what it means. Don't tell them, ask them. Yeah, but what about this? How can Jesus say this? I'm baffled. You're confusing me. You're saying he's a... Ask enough questions and pray. Holy Spirit, penetrate their heart and bring them to the feet of Jehovah Jesus, not this fake Archangel Michael. With that said, can you want me to open up for a couple minutes of Q&A? So, no? What a hater you are, bro. Okay, we're done. All right, God bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Right? Because I'm a Syrian, right? All right, give it up for Sam, man. Dang. That was awesome. That was awesome. But yeah, so that uh, concludes the conference for today. So tomorrow we, we, we will be back um, at 9 o'clock. The doors will open and we'll have some breakfast for you guys. Uh, remember to bring your lanyards. Please write your names on them so we know who you are. Um, and then we got plenty of more topics coming along tomorrow. We're talking about homosexuality, evidence for the resurrection, uh, Augustine, Greek. We're talking about transgenderism, slavery, Quran versus the Bible. So plenty of topics with plenty of more awesome speakers. So make sure you guys show up. Um, 9 o'clock if you want some breakfast, um, but everything is going to start at 1030. So I'm going to go ahead and pray us out, and then we can all um, be dismissed. So God, we thank you for this conference. Uh, we thank you for the truths that were taught, and I pray that you will give us hearts to search out these truths so that we may know how to defend uh, your glory um, in the midst of the cults, God, and the people who object you. Um, help us just to glorify you and keep us safe on the ways uh, to our destinations and uh, bring us back safely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.